the same time, probably our degree of certainty about what that's going to look like um, has been changing massively. Um, and a lot of the goalposts are shifting on an incredibly uh, dizzying pace. Um, so really to kind of um, give us a little bit of um, guidance into how to make sense of all of this, we um, are really delighted to have uh, Noah Rayford and Anna Jane join us uh, today, just to sort of kick this around. Um, the way it's going to work is uh, Noah and Anna are going to have a sort of 15 minute or so intervention at first. Um, we will then have time for some questions. Thanks for those of you who've sent questions in uh, beforehand. Um, if you haven't and something pops up, use the chat function and we'll do our best to try and pick um, some themes that are emerging from that. Um, so I'm not sure if they need introduction. It sounds like a lot of people, certainly from the people I spoke to in the breakout room, know exactly who you are. But for, for, um, for the benefit of those who don't, Noah Rayford is um, the Futurism Chief uh, and Chief of Global Affairs at the Dubai Future Foundation. Um, and Anna Jane is the uh, Co-Founder and Creative Director of uh, Superflux. So without further ado, uh, Noah, the floor is yours. That's great. Thanks, Branson. Can everyone hear me? Give me a thumbs up. Um, as I was saying, I'm quite disappointed that you don't have funkier faces on, but, uh, but I see a bow tie, so that, that's good. The um, pleasure to be here, guys. Um, Brenton uh, had, asked, had asked me to frame, I think, sort of set up Anab uh, in a way. Anab and I have been working together for and learning from each other for a um, number of years. Uh, and so given that I think she's going to focus a little bit more on the speculative design, the design fiction side of how, how you engage and communicate people um, with different media, uh, I'm going to take a step back and, and do a little bit of an overview of sort of why we future and some approaches to how we future. And then also in particular, um, Brenton and, and, and Anab and, and I see Nick and a couple other people on the call here are part of a kind of globally distributed group of futurists uh, that came together recently to start to try to think through a bit of the confusing times and develop a set of, of uh, sketch scenarios for what might happen from a political and economic sense if COVID-19 lasts for the next 18 months or so, which it looks like it might. So um, without further ado, I think I'll just jump into sharing my screen. Does that sound good, Brenton? Yeah. Hey, yeah, go for it. All right, everybody seeing this? Thumbs up, okay. Um, so just for context, I love this photo. So I live and work in Dubai, uh, although uh, before the, the virus shut things down, I had a global role. So I spent about half my time globally uh, traveling around with um, home base in, in London half time. And part of what I do for an organization, the Dubai Future Foundation is to engage in conversations like these and try to knit together a network of interesting thinkers and different points of view. And that, that all comes together in a variety of different forms through this organization, the Dubai Future Foundation. Um, one of the ones that I'm most proud of, you see in the distance to this picture here is the Museum of the Future, which uh, was on track to open end of this year, but will probably be a year, a year after that, which is uh, in many ways, the will be the world's largest instantiation of the overlap between futures thinking, um, design fiction and speculative design or experiential futures and policy application. Uh, and Dubai really is the, at the sweet spot of that Venn diagram of, of taking a rigorous and analytical approach to the future, coupling it with creative ways of engaging different people about that in a way that actually makes um, real policy and economic change. Um, but it's important, I think, to ask this question, why? You know, oftentimes I, I see some friends on the call who, who uh, we've, we've had this conversation before, but oftentimes when you're talking to a client or your st other stakeholders in government, um, it seems like futuring or thinking about futuring is a, is a luxury. Uh, but, you know, the reality is, as we all are experiencing yet again, um, human beings in general are terrible at the future. We just tend to underestimate the complexity of things. We're overconfident in our own knowledge. We tend to look at things that confirm our beliefs and we, we are swayed by whatever happened recently and by people we respect. And we truthfully uh, you know, ignore things that are uh, challenging to our views, uncomfortable truths, everything from climate change, you know, literally the inconvenient truth down to much smaller scale examples. Uh, and and you know, there are basically two main reasons behind this, one of which is around our brains uh, and how we perceive things. So we as individuals and groups, we miss important changes that happen around us. But also, critically, we failed to imagine how these changes might combine. So we, 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 we miss change and we can't imagine or we often try not to imagine how those things might combine into different outcomes. I mean, I, 
you are probably all familiar with cognitive and social biases, everything from inattentional blindness. You know, this is a classic study at Yale that Darren Brown, the magician, reproduced, where 70% of people in this case don't even realize that the person standing in front of them is different than the person asking the question. So, you know, here, this is a great example in New York City. Here's Darren Brown asking for directions, and then an actor comes by with a with a painting and the person changes and it's a different person behind him. So dramatically different, different race, different gender, different looks, less than 70% of people really even notice that there's a, they're talking to a different person. So we, we miss dramatic changes around us if we're not paying attention. We miss slow changes uh, in the environment. And critically, because we are social animals, even if we perceive change, as many of you might have done before um, the new year or just the beginning of the year with COVID-19, there's very powerful forces which act to uh, prevent us from acknowledging those changes if they go against group assumptions. So from everything like banal examples of groupthink, when you're in a meeting with your colleagues uh, and it's more important to, to keep the vibe strong and to agree with each other than it is to debate, to more extreme examples like Stanley Milgram's prison uh, experiments and, and in this case, the electroshock examples where in which someone who has a lab coat and tells us to do something, even if that something goes against our beliefs and causes pain for someone else, most of us end up doing. So the social biases are all there, the cognitive biases are there, but one of the things where it begins to overlap with the work of Anab uh, and our colleagues is that it's also, even if we imagine how, even if we see how things are changing, we perceive these changes, it's very hard to uh, imagine how they might combine to produce a, a kind of different outcome in the world. One of my favorite examples of this, because you know, it uses this word imagine, is from the head of AIG, a uh, big you know, insurance company, financial company in 2007 when people were asking, just starting to ask about the uh, subprime mortgages that they were underwriting, he literally says, it's hard for us to see a scenario within any kind of rhyme or reason that would see us losing a dollar in any one of these transactions. And yet, you know, six months later, they lost $180 billion. Um, I used to use that example, but also we have even better examples on a daily basis. This is a graph of Donald Trump's statements or vis-a-vis -vis the COVID uh, virus from the beginning of, of the year. We've shut this down, it's gonna be fine. It's going substantially down, it's gonna disappear. This is a hoax to suddenly I always knew this was a pandemic and this is a national emergency, right? So uh, part of this is not that we didn't, Trump didn't perceive this. He just couldn't imagine that the thing that was occurring in Asia might actually occur in the United States and that might actually produce such a dramatic outcome. And the reason for these two things, is they come together in, in, in these sort of mental simulations of the world, the way we understand how the world works, both implicitly in terms of our own uh, cognition and our own understanding of the world, but also explicitly as we socialize that with each other. But over time, even if those were accurate, they, uh, they grow to be inaccurate because the world changes and the world changes dramatically around us and that moment we find ourselves in now is one of disorientation, of confusion, of discomfort, and it incapacitates us to act. I'll never forget, I was in a, a, an event with the former head of strategy at the European, um, European Union, and she was saying around the, the surprising influx of refugees um, in the Syrian war, where they thought you know, this was an opportunity to demonstrate European values. And you saw Angela Merkel you know, taking selfies with, with refugees and so many people came and then some bad things started happening. It was literally impossible to believe that the values weren't working in the way that they espoused, that they thought. And the shock, the pain of that, the emotional pain of realizing that your deeply held beliefs about how the world works weren't matching up with the way the world working, uh, she said it literally made her speechless. And so in that four or five weeks of speechlessness that the government authorities didn't respond, you know, we have the rise of uh, populist parties seizing the narrative and, and, and the consequences that that produced. So the point of, of exploring the future in various ways is, is to you develop our kind of cognitive countermeasures, both for us as individuals, but as organizations, and particularly as governments, if you have responsibility for maintaining uh, public welfare. And there's many different ways of doing that. But what I just want to focus on is it's this exercise of helping us to imagine, and the process of social imagination is so important here, how the world might change, right? These are, this is pure speculative exercises, pure creative exercises, but based on rigorous re, uh, exploration, right? That helps us better perceive how it is changing today. 
So you might have seen the Errol Morris uh, documentary, The Fog of War with Bob McNamara. And, and, and he's talking about the Gulf of Tonkin and, and the Vietnam War. He's got this great phrase that he says, we literally see what we want to believe. And it so often proves wrong with such disastrous consequences. Again, I think we're experiencing that right now. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I'll leave it to Anab to explore sort of the best way to do this. It's important. We all know this. We need diversity of views. We need to balance creative and systemic thinking. And we need to tell these stories powerfully. But one of the questions often when you debate around sort of scenarios or design artifacts is sort of what do you, what's the point of scenarios, especially now? And, and what's the point of long-term scenarios? And I just want to share an example that uh, a group that I'm involved in with on a volunteer basis put together to try to explore that question because I think it, it, it very accurately, very usefully summarizes that. Scenarios become buckets for narrative buckets to help us re-engineer our mental models of how the world works, right? That's the point of what I just, of, of all of this futures exercise, try to re-perceive the present. And so by creating a story, a compelling story that makes sense about the future and how we fit in it, we can start to interpret how change is occurring in the short term much better. So this group put together this question, what, this was now about a month ago, what happens if COVID-19 lasts a year or more, takes a year or more to resolve? And out of this exercise, they came up with these three scenarios called the pyramid, the village, and the Leviathan. And I'll just very briefly walk you through these because in the same way that a very early blog post, The Hammer and the Dance, helped capture a kind of narrative framework for us to understand the, the options that we are experiencing. For me personally, at least, this thinking has helped sorting through the news that's coming across and helped start to see like, that's a pyramid-esque development. This is a Leviathan-esque development. How much time do I have, Brenton? Should I spend five minutes on these? You're muted, but I see you nodding. So yeah, okay, cool. Um, now, I just want to emphasize these are not predictions. These are, these are like larger world building exercises that are based on the contribution of diverse, diverse uh, points of view, but that help us represent some plausible buckets for some strange attractors that help us interpret how change is happening in a confusing present. One thing that is clear is all of these, and we see this already now with US unemployment, I think 22 million, all these begin with widespread unemployment. And that necessitates profound state intervention uh, in a way which basically demolishes a lot of the old boundaries between public and private sector and raises all sorts of questions and all sorts of new opportunities. Like in Australia, for example, you now have the Australian government, which is by all accounts quite conservative, paying for childcare. Right? You have Republicans in the United States talking about universal basic income. So the need for the state to intervene in the context of the total market failure of, of a long-term uh, coronavirus crisis is the pivot point that produces three potentially radically different outcomes. But the nature of this outcome combined with how societies respond is going to determine what happens next. And just very briefly, if this is helpful to think about this from a visual perspective, how that political power is excised, is that political power used to concentrate uh, power? Uh, or is it left to diffuse intentionally or unintentionally? And if it is concentrated, does it benefit the elite versus does it benefit the public is the key kind of determinant about these three different worlds that we could end into. So I'm just going to breeze through these very quickly. You can download these online. You know, these are just sort of intellectual buckets to start to think through uh, thought experiments. Does this seem to make sense? The first is the pyramid. And this is a, a, a scenario where in which governments respond to this crisis by basically uh, enacting policies that only benefit the wealthy. Um, we see many examples of this you know, happening right now. This leaves uh, millions of people both exposed to the virus, but also angry and frustrated and looking for someone to blame, which clever politicians use to uh, further stir the kind of oppositional nature of populist nationalism. Uh, unfortunately, poverty and violence continues to increase here, particularly domestic violence and domestic violence against women. In the context, gangs, protests, organized crime, militias begin to flourish and are, are, are flamed and encouraged by populist demagogues. It gives them the excuse necessary to crack down with more extreme measures and totalitarian control, which is basically administered through a combination of military power and digital surveillance tools. So this is a sort of a weaponized Palantir um, kind of world. Now, what happens if government uh, can't get its act together? It either can't or won't or is incapable of mustering an adequate response. And this is a village or kind of scrappy town it has been called. This is where local communities have to step up to fill the void. As the economy contracts and services disappear, communities are forced to support each other through local markets, DIY solutions, 
uh, type of, uh, of, 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 of self-reliance, which is not an entirely a bad thing, right? We get to spend, we're experiencing many aspects of this right now. We get to spend more time with our friends and family perhaps, but it is also uh, significantly more fragile. And as that fragility increases, then any kind of disruption uh, can have dire consequences. And so you see a closing up of potentially religious, ethnic borders, uh, people uh, defending their own territory, circling up the wagon. So this is a very difficult world to be different in, uh, although it does have benefits as well. The third scenario is the Leviathan, or perhaps called the Green Leviathan. This is a, a, a scenario where the governments uh, dramatically expand their power, but instead of doing so to benefit uh, the rich and the plutocrats, they do so to deliver social goals and benefits. So you would start to see in this world a, long, a range of national or nationalized regeneration projects focusing on basic infrastructure and needs like energy, healthcare, education, transport, housing, food supply. Uh, but it's not just a top-down exercise for century and bottom-up digital solutions through digital uh, means. These efforts, these efforts would lay the foundation for a post-crisis economy and something of, we could call a new green deal or a digital green deal or a new new deal. But there's no doubt that this too would have consequences, not just in terms of having to uh, raise significant amounts of public debt in the long term. As the French prime minister just said last night, our grandchildren will be paying for this, but we have to do this now. But also uh, the social pressures to contribute to, uh, to, to, contribute to a shared uniform ideology or vision here are, would be quite profound as well. So it requires a certain degree of a personal sacrifice that uh, many who have been living in perhaps a more entertainment oriented culture might not be comfortable with. This is perhaps more of a, a Singapore, South Korea or an, an Asian model of, of, of national development. So these are obviously just fictitious scenarios. These are three, three uh, stories that people who are working in everything from government to technology to investment to environment came together to reason out how might the world change if COVID-19 lasts a year or more. They're world building exercises. So they're only as useful as, the, as uh, any world building exercise is. But I can say just from personal experience here, as we are dis confused and disoriented and trying to interpret the way the world is changing, having mental models, these are shared social imaginaries that we can use to dialogue with each other and to organize our actions around is uh, basically the only way to transcend the paralysis that we feel and the anxiety which it produces when we are confronted with a reality that doesn't meet our expectations. So whether or not these scenarios are accurate, whether or not there are you know, 25 other scenarios out there is not the point. The point is developing a set of shared narratives about how things could be different that help us perceive small changes in the present and interpret them in a way which is, uh, which is of use. Now, the best scenarios are things which are, uh, are useful, they're powerfully told in different media contexts, and there's linked to decisions that people need to make, be that the cabinet, be that a corporation, a community group, or even you and your own family. And as it turns out, PowerPoint decks and reports aren't the best way to link those to uh, people's decisions, uh, nor to galvanize them, to inspire them or, or, or get them um, emotionally responsive to the kinds of changes that are occurring. But there's a whole other suite of tools, which Enab is one of the world's best at, and her, and her partner, John, who both run Superflux, are among the leading practitioners of, this, of translating these kind of contextual environments, these worlds, into uh, objects, artifacts, and experiences that help people engage more directly and suggest uh, other ways of moving forward. So, so I think I'll just um, stop there and, um, and I guess hand over to Enab now, does that make sense? Yeah, you've done, you've done a better job of segueing than I could possibly know. So yeah, Enab, the floor is yours, Thanks. perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Noah. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks, Brenton. Um, um, I'm just going to, yeah, I'm going to just go straight into contextualizing the need for such different tools. So I think I'm going to start with something that's on everyone's mind, a question about when does a pandemic end or does it ever actually end? And, 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 I, and I think it's becoming clear that this is not going away anytime soon. Um, and um, we are in the state of predicament. It's, it's our predicament that either a pandemic or different versions of a crisis uh, related to climate change is going to become a continual part of our future. So we need to have a kind of open view of this altered state of reality and what we might call unmeasurable uncertainty. 
And the thing is that so far, uh, by and large, our decision makers have relied on very specific kind of instruments to measure and create these visions of the future, evidence-based, undoubtedly scientific and rigorous, but based on existing knowledge. And as Genevieve Bell says, you know, that a data is what has been, not what could be, and therefore is always conservative and, and, and constrained. Um, and, and the rest of it that we are seeing, all the graphs are projections and, and they are fiction. They are, they are as much fiction as the graphs that showed the trends that were going to happen in 2020 last year. Because if I had stood in a room and told everyone that, that a third of the world is going to come to a standstill in the first half of 2020, people would have thrown me out of the room. So the thing is, we've found comfort in such instruments of measuring and predicting because they help us package our futures into neat solutions and roadmaps. Uh, in a way, modernism is to blame, I think, an unquestioning pursuit of a better future. You know, methodologies of mapping, planning, designing, controlling and controlling deeply complex systems is not going to be the answer. Um, but the possibility of uncertainty and being open to multiple possible views of the world is difficult because our prospective brains have not quite been trained to hold multiple wo worldviews in our, in our minds. And we've been trained by the media to see here and feel what, what seems to be the singular future. And, and at this point, I'll um, kind of share my screen and uh, some of the stuff that we do. Um, so does this work? Yeah, so I think and this is where I think our practice uh, maybe is helpful, um, uh, which I co-founded with uh, Superfluff, which I co-founded with John Arden. Um, um, this, um, uh, this is a slide we made in 2015, and I feel we are in that kind of strange in our space right now. You know, for a, over a decade, we have operated on the edges of what is considered normal, working with people and organizations willing to take the risk to explore how they can effectively navigate uncertainty. Something we often told uh, people we work with was that it's just because you cannot imagine a future or a possibility does not mean it won't happen. And today that very edge has become our reality and organizations are scrambling to make their businesses remain relevant in such futures. And I think that's where the power of what uh, we might call speculative design comes in. And frankly, it's not just speculative design, uh, stories, fiction, art, uh, all of it. Uh, cautionary tales, super fictions, ways in which we can creatively imagine different possible futures and bring these kind of naughty worlds into the present. Um, and there's something to be said about the fact that um, these are not complementary tools. These are not tools that work alongside the evidence you see, but almost prismatic tools in a way, um, sh showing possibilities and throwing up things that we might not feel un might, might not feel comfortable with. But I think it's time time to stand up to whatever the consequence of the truth telling might be. Um, and the reason I say this, uh, which Noah kind of also men mentioned, was um, um, the, the, the power of storytelling, the power of imagination um, is, is important because it allows us to, you know, as Ursula Le Guin says, um, uh, tell a completely impossible story without having to avoid avoiding the model of pretending that the story ever happened. And actually, her work is really distinctive because not only because it's imaginative or because it's political, but because she thought so deeply about uh, the work of building a future worth living. Um, and uh, just a little bit to talk about um, things that the one who shall not be named with blonde hair who leads America um, uh, talks a lot, uh, he uses a really, really clever strategy because however much we might hate what he says, what, what he manages to do is show that he's free shows that he's free in saying what he feels like without having to worry about being politically correct. And there are millions of people out in the world who really have felt this trap of one having to feel politically correct and feel and are able to recognize and empathize with that sense of freedom. And there is a term that theorists use called uh, affect theory, which is um, about exploring the emotional contours of life, about um, uh, non-linguistic effects like mood, atmosphere, feelings um, that have a huge impact on the way we make decisions and how we think about our presence and our futures. But somehow, none of that gets translated into the instruments that we use 
to make decisions about our future at the minute. Um, uh, I just want to show uh, very quickly, we did a project again many years ago where we imagined um, dark futures around drones and um, pretty much thinking around Ray Bradbury's kind of, you know, I want to prevent this future, but here we are, we have drones right now surveilling us as if more surveillance is the answer to our, our, our problems today. Um, uh, yeah, a little, um, a little kind of uh, excerpt from one of the uh, drone surveillance drones from the drone aviary project. Um, uh, a project, another project we did uh, uh, with actually Nesta and UNDP and Bond was about imagining a nimble parasitic tentacular organization. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because. That's exactly what suddenly all the large organizations are being forced to do. They're being forced to work outside of their offices in the most nimble and parasitic way. So in this case, we created this fictional organization that does kind of social developmental and international futures, but with a team of eight people distributed across the world. Um, uh, we kind of created the whole um, branding for the organization. We even created kind of case studies of how it preemptively recognizes risks before they happen and pushes it to people's. And this is a case study from Kenya. I won't really get into the detail, but it was remarkable because we presented it as a, as a kind of a real organization inside uh, a, an international development conference next to DFID and um, USAID and all these other large organizations. And um, people absolutely believed that we existed and that we uh, got investment offers, we got partnership offers, we got people who wanted to work with us. And, 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 and then in a follow-up uh, with, with 125 CEOs from different developmental organizations, when we did the reveal that this doesn't quite exist yet, they were like, oh yeah, of course it doesn't. That's what, well, <laughs> hang on a minute. Just yesterday you offered to invest in our organization. So I think this is the power of something that when you see a PowerPoint deck, if I told them that you really need to start thinking in a nimble and a parasitic way about your, your organization, they would have said, there's no way we can do that. When something is presented to them as a very tangible and experiential possibility, um, they can see that it's actually, it's actually possible. Um, but something I want to concentrate a little bit more on one of our most uh, kind of ambitious projects to date is called Mitigation of Shock, where we explored a, a future around climate change, what happens in a future where extreme weather conditions, economic uncertainty, and broken global supply change have changed the world as we know it today. Which actually Dan Hill, who, who recently published his slowdown papers, um, said uh, that it could be shortened somehow by just simply substituting the word virus in there as a virus is a manifestation of some of these deeper fissures. So um, the following uh, extensive research and prototyping um, and interviews with Met Office uh, execs and NASA and so on, we imagined this future um, London and then built this kind of entire apartment um, where a family is, or family or residents are living with this new new reality of, of climate change, post climate change and kind of economic instability. Um, it feels kind of strangely familiar yet alien, a domestic space um, with evidences of familiar artifacts, but equally signs that show that the world has um, ever so slightly, but then slowly as you turn around the corner, realize quite significantly um, changed. Um, cookbooks that suggest a different way of eating and consuming food, a domestic space alive with multi-species, inhabitants surviving and thriving together in an indoor microcosm. Um, we spend a lot of time prototyping and building things that actually worked and put them in the speculative future so that there is a, a sense that this is not complete, this is not uh, a render, basically. It is not uh, uh, it is not something that 
into something that you can genuinely experience. And as people spend time in this space, they found evidence of an altered life in ways that they could relate to how to cook, how to eat and care for one another. There was no mention at any point of words like climate change or global warming, but there was enough evidence of, of, of ways in which they could connect the dots to their own lives. And then recently, um, we've, we have an exhibition, uh, we showed a new version of it at the Art Science Museum in Singapore, where we moved away from this uh, emphasis on, on tech-based food growing systems to more sustainable uh, ways of growing indoor food systems um, using um, uh, principles uh, inspired from permaculture. Um, which we will hopefully slowly publish, which, ho which may inspire people to start doing some of that. And then we also built lots of tools that people might use to gather food, including these Arduino spears that were built from discarded Ar Arduino birds and uh, a whittled bamboo, uh, a kind of uh, internet of things meets indigenous tools or something of that kind. Um, and a view out of the window of an altered Singapore, and then uh, has led me to think a little bit more about a sort of uh, the, found, the uh, kind of a starting point of a field guide that I call uh, a, a practice of a more than human politics um, that starts helping us to see the world from a different lens, from an altered perspective, to see if an, a different lens might help us to think about our, our, our kind of predicament differently. Um, and I'll stop here um, so that we can have a chance for some conversation. Brilliant. Thank you, Anna. Um, there's a lot of richness there, and I would encourage people. Um, I, I'm not sure if normally our chats have been very uh, live. Everyone, I think, has been so intensely listening to both of you because there's a lot of information there. As people are starting to process this, if there are questions, do feel free to start feeding those in uh, to the chat. Um, I, I want to sort of pick up on one of the questions um, that came through before this the session, and and I guess um, it's to both of you. And I'll preface it by saying, I remember um, seeing something of, uh, from Amano Iannucci basically saying satire is dead because um, you know, the, the sort of the strangeness of our politics is actually essentially rendering um, the fiction of, of, of sort of political satire um, not nearly as um, implausible as the reality. Um, so one of the questions um, that we, we got is, has it become more difficult to do futures work given the rad current radical uncertainty that we're faced with. I mean, basically, are our speculative fictions implausible enough, given the implausibility we're currently living through, or or does or can we can we sort of go with the grain of that? Anna, do you want to take that? <laughs> yeah, it's a good. I do feel uh, I have felt very paralysed. I kind of have felt like also. Re frankly rather angry with so many uh, because there's so many times we've surfaced so many of these things with so many organizations who've, who've turned a blind uh, eye and, and refused to acknowledge some of this and funnily enough right now in the midst of some um, explorations where we still still get this constant thing of yeah but after when we get back to when, when we get back to this then we can and we, we kind of I kind of feel we are we have this we are really at this we have critical choice points in front of us right now. We, 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 we are in between worlds, you know, as Zach Steiner would say, that, we, that, that there, is, there is a possibility in, in, in this in-between world to make some really critical decisions and choices. And that can only be made if we, if we are willing to understand that there is no going back. There is mm. really no going back to that. Reality. And do we really even want to go back to some of that? Actually. There's almost an inversion of the futures practice, as I see it, as a bit of an outsider to this. But normally, uh, as I understand it, you know, a lot of a lot of your work is to help people break out of just the status quo and seeing the world as it is. Whereas actually, right now, what we've just seen here is there's almost a, the role to sense make. You know, the the, the yeah. breaking out of the mold has happened. Actually, yeah. the role is to help people to categorize, to synthesize, and to kind of coordinate um, what might what choices they might make. So it's a diff is it a different role? Or, um, for futures in this current environment. Well, uh, if I could jump in, I mean, I think that futures is a is a very um, big toolkit. You know, it's almost like saying innovation or design or something in that nature. So, there, in some respects, it's about knowing which tool to bring to which fight. Um, and you know, 
personally, like I haven't been doing much work with scenarios for the last 10 years or so in Dubai because the utility of, of a narrative is, is useful as a PowerPoint deck or as a document or a report, but it's far less effective than an actual prototype. Right. You still need to do the thinking to understand what might be possible in the future, right? But translating that into a prototype, or as we do with the museum of the future, you know, an actual a functional prototype or an experience or a room is far more efficacious at actually inspiring people to do something. You know, as Anup said, it, it's it's relatable. You can touch it and feel it and interact with it. And the fact that you touch it and feel it and interact with it means you think it's more possible. And in fact, you have one in front of you. So why don't you have 20 of them? Um, but um, but in the current moment, scenarios as a sense-making tool, I think, is making a bit of a resurgence because, you know, the big question is like, well, w what is going on? Like, when, of course, everyone now is asking about when do we get out, but the kinds of conversations the governments have around what does out look like and how do we manage that process is going to produce dramatically different outcomes, right? Dramatically different futures. Um, so there's a utility of having these big narratives around sense-making tools, but I think it has to be coupled with the kind of work that Anab is doing and that many of you guys probably do as designers or as, as, as innovators, because um, how you get to those worlds is, is more important than almost the worlds themselves. I mean, it, it's like you, you paint with a big brush. It's possible we go into a totalitarian technocracy, right? It's possible we regenerate a sort of new sense of eco-nationalism. It's possible things just kind of fall apart, right? But what does that mean for me? What does that mean for my organization? And what do I do about it? That's where it, it, it then evokes the need for more tangible pr uh, proposal making in that space. Yeah, well, that, that actually tees up a, a nice question which, which we got on the feed from Emily uh, Bazalget, uh, Bazalget. Um how might organizations, entities use futures thinking experiential design as an alternative to risk planning? So as organizations are trying to process their choice, as, you, as we've said a couple of times, you know, there's a limited role for slide decks. Can we actually use some of these processes to actually help organizations sort of step through the choices they need to, they need to make? And what might that look like? I kind of want to say that, yes, definitely. I think just to build on Noah and that question maybe is to say that I kind of must must make a point about that these tools, these design-led tools that we use should not be considered a set dressing. Quite often what happens is that we are landed with a fully developed scenario that we are supposed to set dress as designers and like just make form, which is pretty much the problem with with which you know as a traditional designer that's what you do and that's kind of an uh, that that's where i think the problem starts if you re if you really need if, if you really need to think differently and embrace new tools for imagining the future we need to work in parallel with them not mm -hmm. off one after the other so yes if if to emily's question yes definitely if the if, if so getting earlier would be the question <laughs> but don't get them in at the end <laughs> yes yes <laughs> But I, I do think that there, I mean, so it's like, um, look, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a civil servant, right? Uh, before we started the Dubai Future Foundation, which is a wholly government owned innovation agency, um, I was running foresight and, and, uh, and strategy within the prime minister's office in the UAE cabinet, right? And um, the reality is, you know, corporate boardrooms, cabinet rooms, politics is a dirty business, right? So, so it, this notion of the reason, as Anna mentioned, people default to tried and tested tools like risk planning or um, you know, road mapping and these kinds of things uh, is because that's safe territory, right? And as on any of you guys who are working, not just in public sector, but particularly public sector uh, bureaucracies trying to change things, right? Um, know that it's a knife fight, right? And it's an extremely risky to introduce anything new and the chances of that getting, um, that getting approved or, or, or funded are very, very low. But the, the value of this, of doing something like what Anna mentioned, right, when you actually produce a prototype, that is a far more effective knife than any McKinsey PowerPoint deck. No offense to any McKinsey consultants in the room, right? So there, there, there is a way of uh, generating a sense of political confidence in what you're talking about and who you are as an agent and an actor in the system that these things uh, empower in a way that no report or analysis ever will, right? Yeah. I find politicians and, and civil servants will, uh, particularly citizens, will, will by, and, by and large go with something they can touch, feel, and interact with and see others touch, feel, and interact with um, 
if they have a confidence that it's it's not going to get them in trouble. When people are afraid, then they revert to this to to the IBMs and the log frames and all those sorts of things. So this I very much is a set of tools which stand in opposition to and can empower change makers uh, at that intersection to create confidence in novelty that uh, that stakeholders and and decision makers can can put themselves behind because because the enemy is not you know the past. The enemy is IBM or McKinsey, right? I mean, the standard way of doing things. Yep. No offense, IBM so or wanna, McKinsey. <laughs> um, so I want to take a slightly different tack um, and, and just ask a little bit of question about um, sort of democratizing futures. Um, it was one of the questions that sort of came up um, in, in the questions beforehand um, was uh, who gets to shape our futures and how can we extend that space to include more voices? Um, so, I mean, take that at any level you want. How do, how do we actually not just use these processes, but also think about who engages with that and actually who gets to kind of, um, yeah, you know, sort of shape some of those choices. Anna? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a very difficult one. I spend a lot of time thinking about it. And I don't know, I don't, I think, so we have done a lot of projects and we put a lot of our work out in the public, in the public realm, whether that's in, in different ways online or, or, or in public uh, spaces open for people to go and walk in and, and, and we get a lot of feedback and response. And um, I think to it's a bit it's a bit like uh, asking the consumer, quote unquote, to make decisions about the whether to take facial recognition or not. I think definitely we need to, we need to find a way to, to, to bring, uh, to give agency and, and, and kind of a voice to, to, to everybody. Um, but, saying, but, but saying that is one thing and actually pra in practice to, to, to ask people, to ask of them to step out of the, of the real drudgery of everyday life and mm -hmm. then start imagining and even having the, the, the kind of, um, you know, the, um, the kind of possibility of saying that, okay, right now I'm using this, this, this technology and being aware of the consequence of that and, and therefore letting go of what is working for them right now because, they, because of that consequence is really is, is a very big leap. So I think it's one thing to say democratic futures and to actually practice it within communities is, is, is a real challenge. Yeah, um, I mean, I, 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 sorry, yeah, go. go no, on. please, please, Brent, yeah. No, I was just going to say, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thread that's come up in a number of these conversations over the week about, you know, the crisis of social imagination as well. Um, and and, and what, how do we, how do we help, <laughs> how do we help you know, reduce that deficit. Um, I, yeah. I noticed Pat Kane um, uh, asked a question in the, um, maybe try and find it again now, um, in, in the, uh, the chat about, you know, when do we all start properly engaging with Hollywood games companies and Netflix? How do we change the general tilt towards dystopia and the main machines of effect and thus of populist politics? You know, where, where does social imagination start and what are the levers of it and, and how do we engage with that? Anna? Want to jump in. At, at the risk of being one of the speakers in this, I, I want to say less thought leadership would be the starting point. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. I think so much rich social imagination is already happening. You have to just open a book, look at a child's drawing. You know, I, I, I don't think there is any lack of social imagination. There is a lack of social imagination amongst decision makers, frankly speaking, mm -hmm. and 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 I and 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 the and the desire to toolkit to, to make social imagination as a toolkit to, to then apply is the other problem. I think if we just go back and read someone like Le Guin who talks about imagination as a practice. It's a practice, not a toolkit. It's something we do, we work on, we think, we, we, we don't toolkitify it, if that's a terrible word, but um, I think we just have to go and, and, and read or look at a film and it's there. Hmm. Yeah. I, I love. The, I mean, I love the renewed focus on social imagination and on public imagination. Um, and uh, you know, whilst I work with many politicians, and often like to say that you know, uh, leaders need ideas, uh, which is true. The reality is, um, you know, there's there is a social imagination at work, but it, there's a contested social imagination at work. It's not that you know the powers that be don't have ideas. Uh, many forces have been at work for a long time to keep things the way they are and to get things the way they are. And, and, and oftentimes, 
your your decision makers are the people who are winning from those ideas, right? So it becomes a conversation around um, around capability building and skill building and. I think it's about using these tools. If we consider, let's just say design and speculative design, or you get all the way back to the yes men, right? Tactical media and fake news before there was such a thing as fake news, right? These are politically powerful uh, processes yeah. because yeah. they persuade people, they change people's minds, they make them feel one way or another, right? And they, they, they hijack people's emotions or they, they create a response and that is potent. So, Absolutely. you know, in that sense, I think I agree with Enab. It's more important that we train people on how to do this and get more people involved in the mix, right? Than uh, than it is necessarily to kind of come up with more ideas. It's not a lack of ideas, right? It's a it's the fact that most of these ideas have been diligently and deliberately silenced. This is brilliant. I've, I've just sorry. I've, I've, I sort of checked out momentarily there because um, we normally break at the hour to let some people go, and then we shoot on for another half an hour. But this feels like we could just keep going for another half an hour with this. Um, so I'm um, I'm actually just going to just do a very momentary pause and say, look, if people do have if they've got back to back things, go now. This will all be recorded. We will share this with you. But we'd be delighted if you'd like to stick with us uh, to keep this conversation uh, going. Um, and uh, Noah, you're happy to stick around for another thirty minutes. For sure. Excellent. Um, if you are going, um, we will be back next Wednesday uh, with Dan Hill and Charlie Ledbeater and Cassie Robinson to actually really dig deeper into social imagination. So um, hopefully that's a little bit of a, a teaser and we can sort of pick up some more of these, these threads. Um, sorry, not many people are leaving. Um, if you leave to leave in your own time, we'll understand. Um, I wanted to pick up um, Pirat's um, point about, um, so I'll just read it out verbatim. Um, by Noah and Anab's, uh, Anab's points around confidence around the future, very interesting, that you need to pretend that a company doing things in a totally new way exists before people getting the, get the confidence to do something about it. Same with the prototypes, uh, which actually don't prove that things will work in the real world or on scale. So my question is, who in governments will get get the fake it until you make it job in governments, apart from Noah, of course, uh, would a liberal Western democracy tolerate that and how? So, you know, do we get chief futures officers in, in liberal Western democracies? Well, um, <laughs> to date, no. <laughs> um, you know, I think that there's a reason that, that uh, I mean, there's a reason I've been in Dubai for the last 10 years and that Dubai has perhaps, um, you know, like Singapore was the first country to really truly embrace foresight as a method and integrate it with strategy and policy. Um, but Dubai was the first country or the UAE was the first country and Dubai is the first city to really couple that um, with design, right? And with innovation. So to link that long-term world building, futures making exploration with prototyping and policy suggestion, right? And the reason is because it is like many developing cities, but is a fast moving, fast growing city for whom the question of what is next is the key question. Right. Uh, and so it just made sense because this is an effective, it wasn't ideological. This is an effective way of answering that question, a more effective way of answering that question in some cases than other traditional means. Um, the questions are different in other contexts. You know, oftentimes when I travel and talk, you know, people are like, well, how would this work in Switzerland or how would this work in the US or how does this work in Germany? Um, I mean, I, I, I was having a conversation with our mutual friend and colleague, Brendan McGettrick, the other day about the, the, the New Green Deal in, in the United States, right? The problem, I right. think, with much policy dialogue in the United States, but anywhere in the West, right, is this is cons mm. constrained to policy wonkery, right? I mean, right. to Pat's question, if Alexandra uh, Cortez had, had developed a film about this, with characters and you know that you could relate to, it would be far more interesting and influential than a policy a set of policy points, right? Mm. So there, there's there there is something that um, that I don't think the West has cottoned on to yet, uh, and and maybe also there's a deep ideological bias or separation between you know the levers of government and the levers of policy and the levers of entertainment and the levers of private sector. I'm not sure. Or is there also maybe a sort of bifurcation between the worlds of like science and rational rationality and design and creativity and imagination. It feels a little bit too fluffy to sort of, you know, there is a, there is a sort of a, an orthodoxy of, of, of sort of rationalism within governments often that this just feels a little bit too gimmicky to be sort of oh my seen God, as a- Oh that's, that's getting my head spinning. That's, the, oh, oh, that's <laughs> always the word I heard here. I'm the inspirational speaker, but oh, now that you've done with the whimsy and the fluff and the gimmick, let's get on to serious business of looking at right. the evidence. And plotting yes, a future that, that is not going to happen. And here we are today. 
it gets well, no, exactly. No, but that, that's my point. Is that there's a blind worse. spot. There's a blind spot within public <laughs> administration to actually sort of see this as a legitimate discipline and a practice that actually has a role to play uh, in, in public policy. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so that, sorry. No, no, no. I, I, look, I, I think this is, this is, you know, this is part okay. of, um, I, I think this is part of the, the challenge. Um, uh, I, I think I've talked with, with a number of people on, on this call in the past that, that you know, w w one historical sort of view on public administration is this, this has been a sort of succession of different orthodoxies that have slowly, begrudgingly, sort of invited in new disciplines. Um, and in the last sort of 30 years, um, you know, uh, we've started to sort of think about the role of psychology and design. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, be before that, um, you know, we and sort of, I guess, sort of the, the digital uh, skill set has uh, sort of has started to slowly, uh, you know, move the, the oil tanker that is sort of public administration practice into sort of things that are slightly more agile, slightly more sort of iterative, slightly more sort of, you know, user focused. Uh, I guess the question is, you know, I mean, how, how do we continue that process of legitimizing this practice in a, in a sort of a, a fairly sort of small C conservative um, administrative environment? You know, if I could very briefly on that, I, it, there, part of this is a generational thing um, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, when Anna and I started this work, you know, 15 years ago or something, the only people that did this kind of stuff were, you know, basically a handful of people is like, Fabian and Nicola at Near Futures Lab in Geneva and Barcelona and, and Julian Bleeker in LA. It was Anna and John in London. Um, a handful of people mostly constrained to the arts world, right? It, Futures was still a very traditional, rational, linear policymaking exercise and you had big consultancies making a lot of money doing PowerPoint decks on that. But over time, the utility and the efficacy of our approach has, has been proven. But also there's more people like us on this call in positions of power, right? So, mm -hmm. so as things move on, and to Pat's question around video game, you know, cultures and whatnot, as people expect more dynamism, expect more interactivity, as you start to get more weird AR masks on top of every Zoom conference call, you know, um, you're going to demand more, more juice from your future. And, 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 you know, we are all set up to be able to deliver that in a, in a way which um, 10 years ago we weren't, you know. And I say we with a capital W because, um, you know, whilst I, Dubai and myself have played a very small role in cultivating the industry or the field, there is an industry in a field now, right? It's happening all over the place. You can find people and, and it's not just on the creation side, it's on the commissioning side too. So it will improve over time, I have no doubt. Um, I'm just wondering um, a little bit about what inter interaction you've had. Um, James has asked the question, how does a fluffy idea pass the equivalent of the daily mail test? I'm just wondering, I mean, one of the reasons why sort of decision makers uh, are small C conservative is because of the risk of ridicule and, and or the risk of being seen to be um, spending money on follies or mm. things that are not serious or not grounded. Um, I mean, clearly that's not the case with some of the work you've been doing in the UAE. You clearly have, you know, decision makers who understand the value of investing in this sort of stuff. But, um, you know, how, how do you, you know, what, what role, I guess, I mean, Pat may ask a question about Netflix and gamers, but if we're thinking about like the press, how, how, do, you, how do we bring the press into this story? Well, I could share maybe one example here. I think the press is, you know, the press is subject to the vicissitudes of their own needs as well. They need something exciting to report. Uh, and like, you know, years ago, the very first Museum of the Future exercise we ever did in 2014, um, actually Anna was a part of, Anna and John were a part of, we did this, you know, we had a little flying drone and we mocked up this simulation. It was literally a simulation, like a three minute video to imagine what it would be like if drones were used to uh, improve people's lives. And it was just literally like a document delivery service. Um, and we said it was fake and we put it out on YouTube, but CNN picked it up and it got like two and a half, three million views overnight. And that created a policy window that we could actually enact some interesting legislation around drones uh, for civilian use with, right? So the media wants exciting, juicy stuff. Uh, and I think people want exciting juicy stuff. I mean, the reality is like life is really pretty grindingly boring and terrible for most people. Like, like all of us are seeking entertainment and stimulation in one way, shape or form or another. I mean, that's why Meow Wolf is like crushing it in the United States right now because people are desperate for a sense of magic. People are desperate for a sense of, of, of dynamism in their life. And 
So if you can provide that, um, especially in a way that actually makes a difference in the world, then you're going to be a far more effective political actor and the media will pick up on it. The politicians will pick up on that. Organizations will pick up on that. You'll get jobs, you'll get hired, et cetera. So I think, I think everybody wants more juice and it's coming, you know, and it's a way to do it. Yeah, I mean, we used to, we, we have had clients from the government who have told us that we cannot let this, you can only do what is acceptable in terms of a Daily Mail headline. Let's imagine the Daily <laughs> Mail headline and work backwards from that. That, that, that. Those conversations have actually happened. And, um, and, and, and to, to be fair, if you remember a couple of years ago when Verge, uh, Verge uh, brought out this story about uh, Google doing speculative, uh, speculative fiction or speculative mm. videos, about and that was a complete exercise in actually imagining worst case scenarios around data data accumulation and and Verge picked it up and made a big splash and I know the persons involved and they had they went through a completely grueling time and I, I kind of first of all my faith in the press is is is, is at the lowest of low right now so I mean um, do we have to really succumb to the whims and the and the, and the and the desires of the press in order to make the biggest decisions of our lives? Lives. Secondly, my experience is a lot of futures role departments are clubbed with marketing departments in companies, which is why they care about this daily mail thing. If we are able to decouple marketing from futures, we might act on foresight work. Like quite often the marketing team is wanting to create a futures world that they want to then market either internally in the organization or externally. And therefore they only want to tell the story that the company wants to hear internally mm -hmm. or that the company would like to hear of externally. And, and it's the polished future. Yeah. yeah, then that's where the problem is. Yeah, but that's future washing. That's, I think we would all agree that's not, um, I mean, there's almost like a Hippocratic oath that I feel like designers and futurists should engage in. It's like not to lie about the future, you know, not to, <laughs> not to make everything look perfect, like a corny experiment, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's not even, a, that shouldn't even be a joke. I think that should be for a, make it a, make it a necessity. <laughs> all right. We'll all right, call this needs to I... change accords. <laughs> Done. Um, I, want to, I want to change tack. I want to change tack a little bit. I've, I've just pulling some more um, uh, questions from from the feed, um, and I want to talk a little bit about inclusion and inclusiveness. Um, so, how uh, can we create more inc inclusive approach to creating new reality? How are more marginalised voices empowered to have a real say? Uh, I know, Anna, you've written about this. This, you know, how how do we actually uh, create space in these in these fictions to to tell stories that aren't necessarily being told? Uh, and to, to to make sure that they they feature as in our in our future thinking. I'm not sure if you wanted to expand a little bit of, on on that. Um, I mean, um, so sometimes in what what we do is we do a lot of film work and we try and do a lot of documentary film work, which is my actual training before I became a designer as a documentary filmmaker. And so we 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 as and when possible, do try and bring that, uh, that voice um, often through even ethnographic project, research projects. But, um, but it's, um, it's, it's a battle because, um, and again, it comes under the kind of fluff, extra, extra stuff. It's, it just, um, um, even if you look at some of the uh, constituency, like, you know, when you have consultations that the government does around decisions, asking the public, it's usually yes or no. There isn't, the, the, the kind of nuance needed around it does, is not enough. So I think it's the same thing goes for anything. Like, how do you bring the public voice requires time and nuance. Noah, any thoughts? I think there's a lot to unpack in that question. Um, You know, I think I'm on the record on somewhere, somewhere, and this is certainly not the view of my employer by any means, but I feel like, um, you know, part of the cognitive and social biases that make us human beings and who we are is that we actually don't really want to take responsibility for our lives. You know, and this is the psychological roots of fascism. If you go back to Eric Fromm and fear of freedom, it's like, you know, Fromm a lot of us. Me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's for, truthfully, right? The world is a big, scary place. And, uh, you know, we just want to be comfortable and taken care of. And I think that's a natural human instinct. 
and um, you know, uh, oftentimes, you know, in the work that I've done as an urban planner and a policymaker before getting into this for futures work, you know, the there's a, a fetishization of participation in a way that people don't like. People don't really mean on the power on the side of power, nor want on the quote unquote side of the power list, right? On the on the the people whose decisions are being. T taken for. And so everybody wants to spot off their opinion on Facebook or, or the news section, right? But nobody really wants to take responsibility for thinking through the challenges and doing the trade-offs and making the arguments and the fights necessary to actually create change in the world, right? Not nobody, but very few people do. Um, so, you know, again, I think that there is there is the symbol symbolism of participation and the reality of participation. When it comes down to getting the reality of having more diverse views of the future represented, I think the best and most effective way of that is providing these tools for as many different people as possible. Um, of course, engaging as many different people as possible in the conversation, but ultimately it's about scaling up and empowering people who want to fight for their vision of the future, um, becoming better at able to do so, right? Because if you just give somebody a future, it, it's, it's Scott Smith and, 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 and Susan Cox, some of our colleagues at Change, just say, it's like, these are found futures. These are given futures, right? It's like, it's garbage. You're not going to really do anything with it. If you fight for it, then, then it's something meaningful. So, so I think it's more about providing tools and training and capabilities and, and access where they can, you know, um, yeah. but encouraging more people to, to fight for their vision of the future that way than it is about like some sort of, of paternalistic or, or maternalistic giving of access or giving of participation. But that's a controversial view. Okay, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip now a little bit and, and get super practical, <laughs> um, because I think there's often a, a bit of a risk, you know, when people see the Museum of the Future or they see Anna, your amazing work, and it feels a long, long way away from sort of their cubicle or their desk uh, in their their day job, even if they are, you know, in dealing with, you know, futures thinking in their own policy and strategy world. Uh, um, what advice? could you give them about how they could start to, you know, engage with this world? What sort of approaches? We're not going to talk it anything, Anna, <laughs> relax on that front. But, but where, where, where do they start? What sorts of things uh, could they be doing that don't require sort of, you know, massive budgets, don't, don't necessarily require sort of, um, sort of, you know, ninja design kind of um, skills, but nonetheless still start to sort of build um, some muscle in, in this area, what would you recommend? Um, gossip. <laughs> gossip? Yeah, it's a yeah. great tool. Um, everyone li likes to do it. Um, Speculative fi fiction around the water cooler. Yeah, yeah, totally. There are so many ways in which you can use stealth tools, stealth ways of, of infiltrating organizational status quo. Um, you know, can you sneak in a little, uh, a little slide note in, an, in, the, in the weekly office newsletter? Can you sneak in a slide about climate change in the PowerPoint deck accidentally? Could you just, just gossip? Or gift, gift is another good way. Gift things to each other. Gift, um, I don't know, gift a, a, a tool that you might only have to use under certain so to a friend. Like there's so many interesting and um, kind of stealth ways in which we could think about this. I think that reminds me of a story um, that Dan, I think it was Dan Hill told me once about um, sort of doing that stealth thing in, I think about it, it had been in a sort of banking client where they just created a business, um, a, a credit card for a speculative service and they just left it on the board table didn't say anything about it so when they sat down they just went oh what's this and it started a conversation yeah, how, yeah do you, how do you sort of create some discovered items yeah or like you know a, a, a new kind of business card you know this is my new business card or whatever i mean there are so many ways in which we could just kind of start and in some ways these are much more interesting because um you you can do them on a constant basis. So I think one of the things is that you, you, you step into a kind of experiential feature and then you step out. And so you've been in a moment of discomfort, but then you get back to your comfort and your emotional kind of place of happiness, so to speak. But how do you kind of keep poking? And I think we need to keep poking. So I think sometimes these tools of, of stealth could be quite useful. There's a certain playfulness, isn't there? Uh, Noah, have you got some thoughts as well? But I'm 
the playfulness is it. I mean, whilst part of this AR psychedelic face mask is just because I, you know, I'm bored stiff with Zoom um, and in, in and out, you know, there's a classic quote in Futures which says, you know, the job of the futurist is to make the familiar strange and the strange familiar. Um, and so, you know, as Annabelle pointed out, is that sense of introducing some some surprise, some magic in the context of an otherwise quite locked down, banal, highly controlled environment where everything is conforming to your expectations. That is powerful, that's potent, that's magical. It has nothing to do with like huge PowerPoints or giant museums of the future or whatnot. You can really do that on a very small scale. Anything that suggests uh, a, a window of difference that could be exploited and grown. I mean, that's, that's the guerrilla tactics of creating real change in, in any organization, whether it's about the present or the future. Um, and, and futures just lends itself to that. And maybe it's a personality thing, uh, but it is the space where you seem, I mean, normally I'm in a suit and tie. Um, so the lockdown is giving us some degrees of freedom and stuff, but also, you know, explicitly my job has been to do the things that people would get fired for if they failed uh, repeatedly and bigger and bigger scales in Dubai. I mean, that's what many of us as innovators have to do. You get a permission to do a small thing and you do that plus maybe 20% more without permission. And then it goes okay. And then you get permission to do a little bit more next time and a little bit more, all with the, you know, Glomar-like plausible deniability of any association if it goes bad and with the understanding that you'll get fired and excommunicated if it actually um, goes really bad, right? So there's a certain personality trait that I think draws to this and being silly and being a little bit surreal or provocative is, is part of that, um, part of helps that, I suppose, at least for me. Brilliant. No, I think that's really helpful. So a little bit of like some actual tactics and a little bit of the stance that you bring into the work. So actually rehearse, rehearsing your playfulness and uh, to Anab's point, sort of just finding those small moments of, uh, in fact, actually, we, we, we actually did this in our recent States of Change program. We talked about um, small acts of, uh, of daily uh, trans cultural transgression. So basically, are there some of these small acts that you can do that just demonstrate that you are at least challenging the kind of the boundaries mm -hmm. of like the, the, the status quo? And, you know, it, it might be a simple thing, you know, I've, I don't have a really good example at the moment other than George Costanza eating his Mars bar with a fork and a uh, and knife, which I don't think is very relevant here, but, but just doing things that actually show to people that you're prepared to think unconventionally and try things out. Um, yeah. Well, go ahead. In that spirit, no, 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 turn I, into a pickle. I, <laughs> excellent. We, we need more pickle. Um, uh, is that, that's probably where the juice is going to come from. Um, look, I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, I, I, I think I'm just basically, this has been fantastic. I've really enjoyed this and I hope uh, people have um, uh, online as well. I'm, I'm basically going to give maybe uh, Anna and Noah just a, a free, free hit, really, if there's any kind of just parting thoughts, um, any pleas, anything that's, that you feel like you haven't said yet that you want to sort of shout out to this group to have a bit of a mull on. You've got about a minute each. <laughs> You want to go, Noah? <laughs> well, I will do one shout out. Like, I mean, I knew I, bl I blasted over those scenarios, and again, scenarios are a dime a dozen. But as a as a, a contemplative technique, um, those scenarios are are online, and so you can find them I th at this place, graybriefing.com. They're in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. They're in the show notes. It's all a yeah. big volunteer effort of a lot of weird creatives and interesting people around there. So if you use them if useful. They're in like ten different languages. Nothing to do with my day job, just to be clear. Um, <laughs> you know, if. Uh, if I was in the room, if I was <laughs> in a room with Trump, what would I say? I would never be in a room with Trump. I I don't know. I think I think I suppose just just um, something about about the crisis and how you know a crisis is is forcing. Um, uh, it forces us, you know, it forces a kind of skimming and a flailing and a jumping to conclusions and a kind of um, trailing, a feeling of trailing off the abyss. Uh, but, but, but I suppose what a crisis does is, is kind of force a scanning. And maybe I would just kind of see if, if, if we can, for those who can, attempt to, to do a scanning of some kind um, and, and, and make some critical choices, make some critical Brilliant. decisions around the choices they have. So, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. Look, I, 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 we started the we started the session saying, you know, the future is feeling a little bit unwielding at the moment and, and, and a little bit sort of confusing and dizzying. And, and it feels like this has given us a, a little bit of thought about um, and some some tactics about how we can make this slightly less confusing and, and reflect on those choices that, that we have to make. So, look, I 
really thank you again for, for chatting with us. Uh, I'm going to throw it back to James, to, who's going to uh, take us out with a few notes about next week. So thank you. Guys. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Yeah, like I, I really can't close this out seriously with that pickle floating around my screen. I absolutely love it. Um, I'll just quickly share the details from the chat we'll have on the 6th of May. It'll be in the morning if you're in the in Europe at nine o'clock in the UK and ten o'clock for the rest of Europe. And I'm sorry I can't do the time zones for everyone else. Uh, I've got seven, the, I've got seven seven p.m. in Sydney. Okay, that seven helps. p.m. I've I've actually frequently got the time zones wrong. Uh, six, six, turn up one hour. Six p.m. Okay, um, that's going to be with uh, Dan Hill, Cathy Robinson, and Charlie Ledbetter, and um, talking about kind of slowing down and what this might basically say for the future of living. Um, I don't know if you guys are already on the mailing list, but we'll send out all the details, notes, links, etc., recording mm -hmm. all through that on Friday, and um, the link to sign up for next week on that as well. Um, that's all. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank Thanks you. very much, Noah and Anna. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Bye, guys. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Bye-bye.